It divided the generation. It was really the statement of that time. To be able to go into a store where there was people that knew music, it's just a missing part of our society now. I don't really understand why it's gone. What was it that inspired you to make a documentary about Tower Records? Uh, well, I grew up in Sacramento, California, where Tower was based, so it was always a point of civic pride for me. Uh, I spent a lot of my money at Tower Records. I spent a lot of time in Tower Records. You know, uh, uh, music's obviously a big, big part of my life. So uh, when the stores were closing in 2006, um, it was a bit of a bummer. And someone had told me about Russ Solomon and how he started uh, in the business selling U78s out of his father's drugstore. And I just thought it was such a, a interesting beginning to a story. And obviously, I knew the end, closing 200 stores uh, around the world on five continents. So. I figured there would be a, probably a pretty good story in there somewhere. And as soon as I met Russ Solomon and found out what a, what a cut up he was, what a character he was, I knew there was a, a pretty good documentary in there somewhere. Right. When you first started, because it was initially funded through Kickstarter, wasn't it? Well, no, we had actually, Kickstarter was a part of it. We, we had raised a, a little bit of funds to sort of start us off. And then we went around trying to raise funds around the time that the economy had collapsed and everyone had sort of, very politely laughed us out of the room, saying no one was really going to care about a company that went bankrupt two years ago when all of Western civilization was uh, was joining the unemployment queue. So um, Kickstarter was something that definitely kept our film alive. Uh, it definitely proved to people that there was an audience out there that cared for this story. Um, and it really kept us afloat for uh, quite a bit of time, and we were able to use those funds to film a significant portion of the movie, and then from that point, we were then able to collect the rest of the funds to help us finish the film. Well, how did you go about sourcing some of the footage? Because there's, there's one sequence in particular with Elton John kind of buying, going around with a, a, you know, a basket and buying loads of stuff. I had a story that was like found in a dumpster or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we were sort of, we threw ourselves at the mercy of pretty much everyone we spoke to and, uh, and said, if you got any photos, you got any videos, please, by all means, uh, help us out. Uh, you know, some deep internet searches. Uh, we were able to find some, some footage. Um, but that Elton, that Elton footage is actually, yeah, it's crazy. Uh, the man who owns that footage now found it in a dumpster. Um, uh, we don't know who took it. It was probably someone at Tower uh, who probably filmed it for some sort of promotional purposes, maybe. Um, but the, yeah, the proud owner now, he, uh, he found that in, in the trash somewhere. And one man's trash is another man's treasure. I mean, it's obviously something that's quite close to your heart as well. You said you used to hang out there a lot. What was your kind of personal experience with Tower Records? What was the first record you bought? You know, I, oh man, I, 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 they got me so young. I don't even <laughs> remember the first record that I bought there. Um, but you know, I remember the first. I remember the important ones. That you know, the first ones that really sort of spoke to me. I remember buying Nirvana's Nevermind there, right. uh, Blood Sugar Sex Magic, uh, by the Chili Peppers. Uh, but I was buying like cassette singles uh, when I was a kid. So. Um, they got a lot of my hard-earned money, you know, and not as much money as they got from Elton John, but uh, <laughs> a, a healthy sum for a for a fifteen-year-old kid. From watching the film and kind of listening to you talk about it as well, and listening to everyone else talk about it, it seems like it was as much a place to hang out and and meet people and discuss music as as anything else. What do you think the impact is on the kind of local community, like when a place like that closes down? Well, yeah, I mean, I think for for um, people of a certain age, they may only remember Tower as sort of being this big, seemingly corporate entity that had stores all around the world and was just, you know, these big shops. But each store was really, truly run almost kind of independently. Um, I mean, they were all under the same umbrella, but each store was run by the people that were working in the store. They had their own art departments, they had their own local buyers. So it was not so much the people up top telling the people down low how to do business. Yeah people down low telling the people up top how they were doing business. Right. Um, and when, you know, a lot of these, uh, you know, a lot of the stores uh, were closing, I mean, it's very similar to, you know, when record stores are closing now, there is something that's sort of missing because they do represent their city, they represent their neighborhood, they, they represent a music scene. You know, it's more than just a place where uh, uh, goods and, uh, and money are exchanged, it's really more of, uh, that social hangout, because Tower was a place that in, it accepted everybody. It didn't matter what you looked like, it didn't matter what you sounded like, it didn't matter what your interests were, you could come and hang out. You didn't even have to buy anything. I mean, that's pretty, pretty radical thinking if you think about it. Here's a retail business where they don't care if you 
don't buy something. You can hang out for four hours. And there's no other place like that. I mean, even the pub will make you buy something to drink, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, Tower uh, was really, um, you know, one of those places that was, uh, was special to, uh, to a lot of people, a lot of kids, especially to me. Having kind of spoken to a lot of people who are involved, um, what's your take on why it failed? What, what do you think the kind of biggest contributing factors were? Well, I mean, there's a bunch of different um, components to it. You know, one of the things we really wanted to dispel was this idea that it was just simply Napster and the internet that killed Tower. That's not necessarily true. That's a part of it, for sure. Um, but it's a bunch of different factors. Uh, some hubris on the part of Russ Solomon and, and some of the higher-ups at the company expanding too broadly, too quickly, and moving into storefronts that were too huge, sort of getting away from their sort of core values a little bit. Um, but then there's also factors from, you know, within the music industry. You know, once uh, the CDs were uh, introduced, they sort of doubled all of, you know, the, the business doubled, but it was set on a table that only had three legs. Um, but the, one of the more interesting things that I, that I found, and it was one of the first things I asked Russ Solomon, I said, if you had to pinpoint one thing, what would it be? And he had said uh, when they stopped selling singles little cassette singles or CD singles later on. Um, but when you stop selling singles at a small, you know, at a low price, you lose an entire generation of kids even walking into a record store. And that ended up being, you know, one of the main factors, I, I think. Okay. So having done this, I mean, uh, do you have any ambitions to make any more documentaries? Or? Yeah, no, I'm, ma I'm, making, uh, I'm making another documentary right now, but I learned the lesson on this one. I don't want to talk about it till it's finished. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. So is there anything else you're working on next that you can talk about? Uh, no, you know, I'm still wearing makeup and pretending to be other people for a living, uh, which is a good day job to have. So I've got a TV show back in the States that uh, I'm working hard on and, you know, uh, working on uh, another feature documentary and doing a bunch of doc shorts. So just trying to keep busy really just trying to uh, to keep uh, scratching all of my my various creative itches we just happen to be at that right place at the right time you want to call that luck and call it luck what would you call it luck <laughs>